dedicated to geeks and nerds, you're listening to Project I Radio, 24-7, Nerdcastle. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f***? Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show. I am your host, Brian Keene, still flying solo for the entire month. Uh, Just a reminder, in case you've missed the last couple of episodes, uh, welcome to Hell Month, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) I'm not kidding. Uh, This month has been brutal, and it's not even halfway over yet. Uh, Dave is traveling quite a bit this month, and he's also sick. Um... Coop is busy with work uh, and unable to get here a lot because of the inclement weather we've been having. And I am basically writing about 18 to 20 hours a day. Uh, I have a novel that is due on the 31st of this month, and I'm basically writing it from scratch. So uh, what we're doing is, is rather than recording these shows once a week with Dave here in the studio with me or Coop here in the studio with me to sort of play off of what I've been doing is recording a bunch of shows back to back. Uh, basically they're, they're fan service. It's about the origins of some of my books, the stories behind the stories. And we are featuring those all this month and we'll be back with New shows and co-hosts and guests in the studio and all that the first week of April. Today's episode is brought to you by Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing and their new book, Vampire Strippers from Saturn by Vincenzo Biloff. That's Vincenzo, V-I-N-C-E-N-Z-O, Biloff, B-I-L-O-F. In Vampire Strippers from Saturn, there are no rules. Logic is tarred and feathered, dead people come back to life, there's a talking severed head, and every scene capsizes into over-the-top violence or a level of surrealism that would make David Lynch go into depression trying to film it. If you can figure out what Rorschachian Impressionism would look like, it gives you an idea what reading Vampire Strippers from Saturn feels like. Vampire Strippers from Saturn is available from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing in both paperback and ebook. Visit them online at perpetualpublishing.com. Today's show is also brought to us by author J.H. Glaze. Uh, if you visit projectiradio.com and you click on the page for the horror show with Brian Keene, You'll see a big old banner ad there for Mr. Glaze, and you can learn more about his books. And uh, you'll also see a big banner ad there uh, for uh, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. A little bit about J.H. Glaze's book. If you like my Levi Stoltzfus series, or if you like Manly Wade Wellman's John the Balladeer, or F. Paul Wilson's Repairman Jack, or even John Constantine, Hellblazer. If you're into occult detectives, then I I encourage you to check his work out. Okay, so uh, we are flying solo today. I had promised you last week that today's show would be about Dark Hollow and Ghost Walk and Levi and where all that came from. Uh, However, that's gonna be a deep, deep show because Dark Hollow came from a place of pain, and I don't feel like talking about that today, and it's all Brian Smith's fault. Let me explain why. Uh, 
Brian is attempting to do something in his life. Uh, what it is, I'm, I'm not going to get into on the air because it's, it's not for me to share. But as his friend, uh, in, in an effort to show support, I vowed that I would give up nicotine while, while he went through this. Now, why I, I propose to give up nicotine in the middle of hell month when I'm working 18 to 20 hours a day, I don't remember anymore, but it seemed like a really good idea when I, when I volunteered to do this. Uh, the other thing I should point out is that nicotine has been a constant form of my life, be it through cigarettes or through uh, snuff, what they call dip, uh, pretty much since I was 12 years old. I had my my first cigarette at 12, I had my first dip at 13, and I have struggled with both ever since, and I am now a man in my 40s. Um, I've never had any adverse health effects from them yet, knock on wood, but you know, I am a man in my 40s, so the time is coming. I do need to quit. I have tried to quit before. Um, in fact, one of my attempts to quit led to the creation of a little novel that you may know as the Conqueror Worms or Earthworm Gods. So, in honor of that, today, instead of talking about Dark Hollow and the very dark place where that came from, I I'm going to revisit them next week. And today, instead, we will talk about Earthworm Gods, a.k.a. the Conqueror Worms. And uh, by popular request, I've been reading your tweets and and reading uh, comments on the website. I, I haven't responded because as I said, it's hell week or hell month, but yeah, I'm frazzled. I haven't had nicotine in 23 hours now, folks. So if I'm rambling more than usual, or if I'm more fragile, frazzled than usual, that is why. Um, but yeah, we're going to, where the fuck was I? Oh yeah. Your requests. Uh, Obviously, a lot of folks want to hear about Conquer Worms. Uh, Castaways was also mentioned by, by many, Urban Gothic, and Darkness on the Edge of Town. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about all of those books. And since I am doing it nicotine-free, I need some kind of crutch. So although you can't see it at home, I have here lined up in front of me one can of Diet Pepsi, one jug of iced tea, a bottle of Basil Hayden's bourbon, which is my second favorite bourbon of all time, and a lovely, lovely bottle of Ouzo that was given to me by uh, comic book artist Mike Hawthorne uh, when, he, when he was traveling abroad. He, he travels abroad every year, and he always brings me back something to drink, and, and this year it was a bottle of Ouzo. Uh, he gave it to me at the memorial service for J.F. Gonzalez earlier this year, and I have not cracked the bottle. Um, until today. If you've been listening to the show since day one, then you know that, that Jesus Gonzalez was a big part of this. And uh, were he still alive, he would he would be co-hosting uh, with Dave and Coop and I. But he's not here. I'm going to toast him right now. If you're drinking at home, please feel free to pause and toast along. Oh, oh that's good stuff. That black licorice kick. Okay, so anyway, before we get into the books, just a little bit of news, a little bit of news. Um, as I am recording this, yesterday it was announced that there will be not one, but two Ghostbuster, Ghostbuster movies in the making. Um, and the internet has kind of imploded over this. Everybody is pissed off. Uh, the... There, there's one camp that is angry that they're remaking Ghostbusters at all. Uh, there's a camp that feels a little backstory. Uh, one of the reboots has an all-female cast, and the other reboot apparently has an all-male cast. There are some that think this is an intentional slight, uh, that this is done by Sony to appeal to certain groups based on gender. Uh, there is a camp who feel that the just announced male version of Ghostbusters is a slap in the face to those who are looking forward to the, the female only version and vice versa. Uh, basically it's, it's, uh, 
you know, the, I guess, I guess you'd call it modern feminists uh, versus the modern men's rights movement. And they've crystallized over fucking ghostbusters for God's sake. Now, Look, I, I think my record speaks for itself when it comes to equality and feminism. I consider myself a feminist, um, but I, I just, what, what the fuck is wrong with people? There, there is shit going on in the world. You know, Boko Haram is, is kidnapping, uh, you know, young girls and forcing them into sexual slavery. You know, we've, we've got ISIS just slaughtering women. I mean, just slaughtering them and, and also forcing them into sexual slavery and, and not just women, but they're, they're killing people based on religion, based on creed, based on, you know, their their vocation. It, it, we've got all this shit going on. We've, we've got Obama and Putin reenacting the Cold War. And but yeah, let's let's fight about Ghostbusters. And I don't mean to to denigrate or disparage people's genuine concerns. I get it. Ghostbusters is a beloved franchise, okay? And and people of a certain age feel a very strong affinity to it. It's, it's part of their childhood, okay? But it's not yours. You don't own it. These big giant media companies own it. It's owned by a corporation. And a corporation, at the end of the day, they're going to make money. And in this case, they're not trying to start a gender war. What they're trying to do is make the biggest buck they can, okay? They're not just making two Ghostbusters reboots. They are planning on spinning this thing off into a TV series and an entire series of movies and new novelizations. What they're doing is what a lot of other media corporations are doing right now. They're, they're seeing the success that Marvel has had with its cinematic universe, and they want to tie everything together. Well, good on them. You know, I would point out that Marvel started that shit back in the 60s, and that's why they're so good at it. And maybe some of these Johnny-come-latelys should just focus on making good films and not copying what Marvel's doing. But, you know, who am I? Nobody listens to me. Uh, my only complaint about either Ghostbusters remake is that neither one of them will apparently involve Bill Murray. Uh, so I probably won't see either one of them. But, you know... If you want to go see one, if you want to go see the other, go see it. You know, hey, great, there's two of them. There, there's something for everybody. I don't know. I'm old. Maybe I'm out of touch. But uh, I don't know, man. Uh, we we are increasingly divided in this country. You, you can no longer just be an independent. You have to be a progressive or a conservative. You have to watch Fox News or MSNBC. You have to root for the Ravens or the Giants. You have to like Star Wars or Star Trek, Marvel or DC, Stephen King or Dean Koontz, Pepsi or Coke. Shut the fuck up! That's the problem with this country is, is we are split into teams. They have us divided. They keep us at each other's throat over bullshit. And meanwhile, you know, uh, we're becoming an increased police state and and nobody does anything because, you know, they're busy fighting over the Super Bowl or which brand of soda pop they prefer or which pop culture franchise is better than the other. But anyway, enough about that. Yeah, two Ghostbusters movies coming your way in 2015 and 2016, respectively. Okay, so, Earthworm Gods slash The Conqueror Worms. Let's talk about that first. Earthworm Gods started as a novella called Earthworm Gods. I wrote it in 1999 and 2000 when I was living in Buffalo, New York, uh, with my then girlfriend, who would later become my my second wife, now my second ex-wife, um, Earthworm Gods. The the idea for the the novella, because it was a novella first, came from two different things. Um, the first was I was trying to quit nicotine, much like I am today, and I was four days into withdrawal. Now I don't know how many of you have tried to quit. I don't know how many of you have tried to quit cold turkey. Uh, I've done a lot of drugs in my time, folks, and I've had 
all kinds of addictions. I'm here to tell you nicotine is the hardest thing I've ever tried to, to, to kick. Um, I've tried the patch. I've tried the gum. I've tried Chantax. I've tried the vapes. Uh, the only thing that really works for me is cold turkey, and it is brutal. Uh, but, yeah, I was, I was four days into withdrawal. And at the time, I, I wasn't working full time as a writer. I still had to have a day job. I was working for GE Capital. And every day I would walk from our apartment. We were actually a suburb of Buffalo. We were in Lancaster, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo. And every day I'd walk from the apartment to the GE Capital building, which was probably about three miles. And part of the trek was along this industrial wasteland, looked like something out of Mad Max along these train tracks. And the snow was melting and there was water everywhere. And of course, when it rains or when the snow melts and there's a lot of water on the topsoil, what happens? Well, if you're a rural person, a rural person, you know what happens. The worms come up from the soil because they need oxygen and they can't get it down there. So I see all these worms everywhere. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, what if there was like this biblical scale flood and there's that much water on the surface? You know, what what size worm would that push up? And it was just those two very separate incidents, me four days into nicotine withdrawal and that idea. And that day at GE Capital, when I should have been on the phones working, I was instead sitting there in my little cubicle, which was just like office space. And uh, I started writing the first draft of a novella that would be called Earthworm Gods Longhand. Um, and I worked on it when I got home that night. And it took me about a month. And I finished it. The main character was based on, <clears throat> excuse me, based on my grandfather, uh, Ward Crowley, who is no longer with us. Uh, I wrote a, a remembrance of him. I believe it is in Trigger Warnings. Uh, if it's not in my book, Trigger Warnings, then it's in Leader of the Band. I'm not sure which one. I believe it, it's in Trigger Warnings, though. Uh, basically, the, the main character, <coughs> Teddy Garnett, is my grandfather. Uh, talks like him, acts like him. Uh, some of the experiences Teddy relates are experiences my grandfather had. Uh, his best friend, Carl, in the book is based on my grandfather's best friend, Billy, who also is no longer with us. And the town of Pumpkin Center is based on a little town in West Virginia where they lived and where I grew up part of my life, a little town uh, outside of Lewisburg called Otto. You'll never find it on a map. Uh, you'll be lucky to find it driving. <laughs> I mean, it's... It's tiny, but it's it's exactly like Pumpkin Center. And uh, although I live in Pennsylvania and although I've spent a lot of my life in Pennsylvania, I, I do tend to think of that little town in West Virginia as home. Uh, when my youngest son graduates high school and goes off to be a man, that is probably where I will retire. So it was it was fun to set a book there. Uh, so, yeah, I wrote the novella, and it was published in my, my very first short story collection, No Rest for the Wicked, and it was also published in uh, another collection called 4x4, which I had co-written with Coop and Michael Oliveri and Mikey T. Hike. Um, that was 2000-2001. People really enjoyed the novella. Uh, while I think every other story in No Rest for the Wicked should not have been published, their weak amateur efforts of a writer who was still learning to write. And I, I really, in hindsight, I, I don't think that book should have ever been published, but, you know, fuck it. Um, but Earthworm Gods, I, I was proud of. It, it was the start of something. And of all the stories in that book, and of my contributions in 4x4, that was the one that seemed to connect with people. So I eventually wrote a sequel called The Garden Where My Rain Grows. And that first appeared in my second short story collection, Fear of Gravity, which was published by Delirium Books. It was set in the same world, but it featured different characters. And uh, the premise for that was 
again, it was just it was something simple. I was down in Baltimore's Inner Harbor looking around, and I, I thought, wow, what if uh, what if this was Earthworm God's world? Because, you know, the, the first novella had been set set in, in rural, you know, rural West Virginia. And here I was in this, this big metropolitan area. And I started imagining that. And uh, then I had a vision of Cthulhu rising up over the, the World Trade Center there in Baltimore. Um, at the time, one of my best friends, Jimmy, uh, who I had, I had known since we were young, young men, uh, we were going to be horror writers together. This was our plan. Well, it didn't work out that way. Jimmy had ended up uh, going to state prison for a while. And I was starting on my career as a horror writer, and, and he was not. And I had a lot of guilt over that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the main character, when he finds his friend's head, his friend Jimmy's head, that was me sorting through that guilt. Uh, the second novella, The Garden Where My Rain Grows, uh, again, was very well received by readers. Uh, it was the first thing that I, I really got like a, a lot of really positive reviews on. And everyone seemed to agree that I should, you know, turn these into a novel. So years go by. The Rising and City of the Dead were big successes. Terminal was not a success. Uh, we talked about that in last week's show, all three of those. And uh, Shane Staley, who was my editor at Delirium, and Don Daria, who was my editor at Dorchester and Leisure, they both asked me what I was going to write next. Delirium, of course, was publishing all of my hardcovers. Uh, Dorchester and Leisure were publishing all my paperbacks. And I pitched them Earthworm Gods. And they both loved the idea. So I wrote it. Now, there is a popular misconception that all I did was take those two novellas, Earthworm Gods and The Garden Where My Rain Grows, and mash them together and say it was a new novel. This is incorrect. Uh, I've written about this at length. In fact, if you get the author's preferred version of Earthworm Gods, which is out from Deadite Press, I talk about this in the in introduction. If you mush those two novellas together, they equal about 30,000, 35,000 words. And yet the word count on the novel, Earthworm Gods, is 85,000 words. So obviously I wrote a lot more than just those two novellas. And hopefully now we can put that to rest. But yes, I, I did marry them together. I wrote the novel in the style of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, which has always been one of my, my favorite science fiction stories. One of my favorite post-apocalyptic stories had a huge impact on me as, as a kid. And, you know, if you've ever read War of the Worlds, it's one narrator, one protagonist. And then in the middle of the book, he stops and he tells you about this adventure this other guy was having <laughs> in another place. And then he comes back and finishes his story. Well, I wanted to do the same conceit with the novel. So I did. Uh, it opens with, with Teddy. And then we switch to Kevin and Sarah in Baltimore. And then we bring those two groups together for the third act. Um, Delirium published it under the title I wanted, Earthworm Gods. Dorchester Leisure did not. They felt, their marketing people felt that Earthworm Gods was too vague of a title. That it didn't say, hi, I'm a horror novel. Uh, in fact, I remember the quote sitting in the boardroom, one of them said, well, this could be a, a treatise on gardening for, for all a reader knows. I was kind of skeptical, skeptical about that, but career wise, I wasn't to the point yet where I could call the shots. So I caved and they changed the paperback title to the conqueror worms, which has led to a lot of confusion among readers over the years. But yeah, I've always preferred the title earthworm gods. And when I got the rights back and the book was republished, I released it as Earthworm Gods. The cover to The Conqueror Worms logically and realistically should have destroyed my career, but it did not. If you've never seen the cover, Google, Google Brian Keene, The Conqueror Worms. And what pops up is this horrendous picture of an HO model train set town and, uh, 
what looks like photoshopped earthworms suspended on perhaps fishing line. There's not a drop of rain in the sky. Uh, if you look in the background, you can see that the power is still on. It is a terrible cover. It is it is terrible in ways that makes your average Asylum Sci-Fi Channel original movie look like a masterpiece. Uh, but people got beyond the cover and they read the book and they liked what they read inside. And that has become definitely, I would say, my second most popular series after The Rising. I think uh, the Worms franchise has more fans than Levi. Uh, probably more than the Lost Level. Uh, you know, the Dead Sea world, I, the, the Worms are very popular with a lot of people. And I dig that because I, I love them. They're fun as fuck to write. And, you know, it allowed me to work some things out. Not anything as personal as The Rising or Ghoul, which we've talked about. You know, it was a, a little milder process for me. But still, I, I put a lot into those books and I'm very proud of them. And I am delighted anytime somebody tells me they enjoy them. I'm going to pause now for a drink. You at home can drink too. Okay. So the Conquer Worms, or as I call it, Earthworm Gods, that begat another sequel, Earthworm Gods Deluge. Now, I did that for free on my website. I did it as a, a weekly serial. Every Friday, I would... I would write a new chapter and post a new chapter. That was a lot of fun. Um, it was me experimenting early on with, you know, serials and seeing how many people would actually read a book in that format. And it was very successful. Um, successful enough that, you know, even though I had given it away for free to everybody, uh, you know, the hardcover still sold out and the paperback and the ebooks do very well to this day. Um, and then, of course, there was a third book, Earthworm Gods, Selected Scenes from the End of the World, which is 32 short stories set in the world of Earthworm Gods. Give you a little more behind the scenes info. So, yeah, that is the story of Earthworm Gods, or as some of you may know it, The Conqueror Worms and how it came to be. Uh, definitely of the things I've written, definitely one of, of my favorites. Uh, now, what else did we want to know about? We wanted to know about Castaways and Urban Gothic and Darkness on the Edge of Town. And I'm going to talk about all three of those together because they represent a very specific moment in my career. Um, and it wasn't a good moment either. Uh, quite frankly, I was, I was burned out. Success and fame and the bullshit of the business and the bullshit of having a public life and, and trying to keep it private had gotten to me. Um, you know, obviously I, I'm not famous. If, if I go for a walk in New York city, I'm not going to get recognized. Uh, however, if you read horror fiction, you, you probably know who I am. And in fact, I, I have been recognized a few times, uh, Probably the funniest was in a bathroom in the, the Denver airport. <laughs> Guy just freaked out. Oh, my God, you're Brian Keene. Um, <laughs> what's great is that same airport, about a year later, I had the opportunity to do that to Jonathan Mayberry. Uh, we were both traveling on business and just happened to be at the airport at the same time. Didn't know each other were there. And I walk in the bathroom and I see him standing at the urinal and, you know, I, just, I had to fuck with him. It's a crowded men's bathroom. And I'm, oh, my God, it's Jonathan Mayberry, dude. <laughs> Embarrassed the fuck out of him. But, uh, yeah, if you ever run into him into in an airport, do that. He loves that. Anyway, I was – even a little bit of fame is a fucked thing. And uh, I could do a whole show about that. Eventually, I w will do a whole show about that. But – Suffice to say, I was burned out. I was tired. I was disillusioned. I came into this business as a fan. You know, I grew up reading horror fiction, and then I was lucky enough to get a job writing horror fiction. And for a while there, I was giving back to a genre that had given me so much. And at some point, the bloom faded from that rose, and 
I just, I couldn't fucking do it anymore. And it was showing in my writing. I admit it was showing in my writing. Um, and a good friend of mine said, well, you know, maybe do some pastiches. Go back to some of the writers that inspired you that you enjoy and, and, and try capturing something in their spirit and, and their style. And I thought, well, that's a decent idea. So I pitched Castaways to Delirium and Leisure. Uh, now, once again, much like Earthworm Gods, Castaways had originally started as a shorter work. It was a short story that I wrote after Dick Lehman died uh, for a tribute anthology called In Lehman's Terms. Uh, the short story is about 4,000 words. Castaways is about 85,000 words. So, you know, again, there are stupid people on the internet. You may not be aware of this, but <laughs> yeah, there, there are stupid people on the internet. And some of those stupid people will say, oh, well, well all it is is the short story. Well, no, you, you're an idiot. It's not just a short story. It's a full-length novel. Um, Castaways was me trying to summon some of Dick Lehman's spirit. It was me trying to write a, a Lehman novel. And I think I succeeded. I even used the word rump in the book, which uh, if you're a Lehman devotee, you know that word gets used in everything the man's ever written. Um, when I was done with Castaways, I felt good about it. Uh, it's not one of my favorites of the things I've written, but it's a, it's a perfectly serviceable novel. It's entertaining. It works for what it is. Uh, but I was, I was, you know, I felt better than I had in a long time, but I, I was still feeling burned out. So then I decided, all right, let's, let's try, uh, doing some Edward Lee. So I wrote Urban Gothic, which is now granted everything I write, you know, I'm, they tag me with this extreme horror label. I don't know that I'm extreme horror. I, I would point to works like Girl in the Glider and, and say, you, you tell me what part of that is extreme because it's not. But yes, granted, there's a lot of blood and guts and violence in the, in the things I write. And there's certainly a dark edge. Urban Gothic is miles beyond any of that. Uh, Urban Gothic is me trying to do Edward Lee. And again, I think I succeeded. Uh, it, again, it, it is not one of my favorites of the things I've written, but I know that it is a fan favorite. Uh, I would guess that as far as standalone novels go, it's, it's probably my second most popular novel after The Rising. I think over the years, it's, it's even outsold City of the Dead and Dead Sea. So there are a lot of fans of Urban Gothic out there. Um, I, I, I had a lot of fun doing Urban Gothic. It was fun to see just how gross I could get, just how Edward Lee I could get, uh, to the point where I, I'm actually doing a sequel to it uh, because so many readers love it and because so many readers want something more like that. Uh, I've been working on a sequel called Suburban Gothic, where basically the the surviving mutants from urban Gothic move to the suburbs and, and try to start the whole process over again. Uh, that novel is far from finished. Um, it, it's not that it's a chore to write. Actually, it's a joy to write. The problem is I don't have a deadline on it. I have deadlines on other things. So those things have to come first. Now I'd done my layman pastiche. I'd done my Lee pastiche. I was starting to feel it again, feel my oats again. I, I was starting to fall in love with the genre all over again, but I wasn't quite there yet. So then came my Stephen King pastiche, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Um, now, again, there's, there's no real secret origin story for that other than I wanted to try my hand at writing a Stephen King novel. Uh, I also wanted to write a novel that was basically a, an alternate universe version of Ghost Walk. What if Levi had not won at the end of Ghost Walk? What if he had failed? What would have happened next? Darkness on the Edge of Town was, was what would have happened next. Uh, I make no bones about it. It is, it is me doing a pastiche of Stephen King's The Mist. Uh, the Mist is one of my favorite works by King. It's one of my, my favorite post-apocalyptic works. I've 
reread that, oh, at least 20 times in my life. I love the film. Um, and yeah, Darkness on the Edge of Town was my version of The Mist. I even referenced The Mist in the book. Uh, you know, I have the, the characters talking about, oh, this is just like The Mist. Um, never in a million years did I think it would be the the novel of mine that, that King would read and blurb. I, you know, I knew, uh, you know, behind the scenes that that he does, in fact, read my works. He, he reads a lot of people's works. Uh, he just can't talk about it because, you know, when you're that big, you can't talk about every book you read because every fucking two-bit author in the world is going to be chasing after you for a blurb and who has time for that so but yeah it, it it always amused me that you know i guess that was earlier this year that, that that was the one he took to twitter to talk about and tell folks to read and and steve if you're listening thank you again for that uh that came at just the best time you know that uh, there was a really dark period in my life jesus had just passed and, and then that came in fact i was i was with his widow uh, when that tweet hit Twitter, uh, <laughs> I told her, oh, look what just happened. <laughs> yeah, our first thought was, damn, why wasn't Jesus here to see this? But uh, yeah, man, if you're listening, thank you again for that. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. And thank you for writing The Mist because, uh, you know, that's brought me a lot of enjoyment over the years. And then when I when I did my pastiche of it, that was finally what broke. The dam broke. I was back. I had written Layman, I had written Lee, I had written King, I had gotten all the the disillusionment out of my system, I was in love with the genre again, and I think it shows, because the very next thing I wrote was A Gathering of Crows. Uh, critics love Gathering of Crows, they think it's one of my best novels. I don't know if it is or not, I know I'm, I'm fond of the book, I enjoy it, uh, but I know that sales-wise, it was it was going to be a monster. Uh, Gathering of Crows came out, and early data on BookScan and and from the bookstores, it looked like it was going to hit the bestseller list. Now it would have been it would have been in you know the 90s. It wouldn't have been in the top 10, but it was going to hit the bestseller list. Uh, it was on track to to outdo what The Rising had done. Unfortunately, it was only in stores for a week. And then Dorchester and Leisure had their meltdown and that whole thing happened and they went out of business and I never saw a dime for Gathering of Crows other than the advance that I got paid before I wrote it. I never saw any royalties. Uh, I never, in fact, saw concrete sales statements. So I only have, the only data I have to go on is hearsay, you know, what they told me. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a bestseller. I have no reason to think they lied because they never lied before about those things at least about that they didn't lie but yeah i you know gathering of crows uh, i i remember more than one reviewer saying you know some variation of yeah keen has got his mojo back well that's what it took it took me revisiting some of the authors that i enjoy reading and consciously making an effort to try to capture a little bit of their spirit in my own work uh to get me back to that point. And, I, you know, I, lots of writers do that. Um, I don't know how many of them talk about it or admit it, but lots of writers do that. There's no shame in doing that. Um, it is absolutely important that you find and develop your own voice as a writer. Yes, you must have your own voice. But there's, there's no shame in also paying tribute and honoring you know what has inspired you you know i'm a big believer in in talking about books i enjoy and things that have inspired me i can't tell you how many 20 year olds and, and 30 year olds and teenagers have come up to me at signings and said you know thank you for for talking about jack ketchum and joe lansdale and f paul wilson you know i i would have never read them but you know you talked about them and and i picked them up and Wow, their stuff is ape shit, and I'm I'm buying all of it. Well, that's great because their stuff is ape shit, and you should be buying all of it. Um, so you know, I I don't think there's any shame or anything wrong with with paying tribute 
um, just make sure you do it with your own voice. I mean, you know, every writer, when they're starting out, they're going to sound like who they've read. That's just a part of the process. Uh, but as you grow, as you keep writing, you will develop your own voice. And yes, your own voice will echo with that of other people, but that's okay. So yeah, Conquer Worms slash Earthworm Gods, Castaways, Urban Gothic, Darkness on the Edge of Town, that is where they all came from. And that is all we have today. Now, as I said, next week uh, we will talk about Dark Hollow, which is a very dark origin story, uh, which I guarantee you none of you have heard before. But we're going to talk about it on the air. I have permission. And we're going to talk about Ghost Walk, uh, which was the sequel to Dark Hollow. And, of course, the introduction of, of fan favorite character Levi Stoltzfus. And then we'll talk about all the, the Levi books, Gathering of Crows and Last of the Albert Witches and uh, the novel I'm almost finished right now, Invisible Monsters, and what is to come for him. Uh, this week's show, again, is brought to you by Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing and their new book, Vampire Strippers from Saturn by Vincenzo Biloff. That's available in paperback and ebook. Visit them online at perpetualpublishing.com. Um, and thanks to them. Thanks to J.H. Glaze. Uh, I'd like to remind you that The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and all other platforms via Project iRadio. Visit them online at projectiradio.com. If you'd like to be a sponsor, email jess at Project iRadio. That's jess, J-E-S-S, -S, at Project iRadio. Folks, I am going to go bang my head against the wall and scream and cry for nicotine. Uh, you do your own thing tonight, but be good to each other and uh, find some person and tell them you love them. Jesus, I'm, I'm out of it. And I, I only had one sip of Uzo. Anyway, we will see you next week. Hopefully, I will be a bit more together. Uh, I will either be smoking again or I will have kicked this thing, one or the other. We'll see you then. Peace. Dedicated to geeks and nerds, you're listening to Project I Radio 24-7.